Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another virtual event at the National Library of Scotland. My name is Jo Stevenson, and I'm part of the library's events team. Today, we welcome Philippa Rader back for part two of her talk, Rebinding the Birds of America in the Royal Collection. Philippa is an accredited conservator restorer through the Institute of Conservation and a professional associate of the American Institute for Conservation. Now working in private practice until September 2019, she was head of the Royal Bindery in Windsor Castle for the Royal Collection Trust. After Philippa's presentation, there will be an opportunity to answer some of your questions, so please do get your thinking caps on and type any queries you have into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And now, without further ado, please welcome Philippa. Hello, everybody. So I will start my presentation. And just here we go. So um, to recap, for those who are with us on Tuesday, we left the story at the point of having completed all of the paper repairs and adding the guards to all the plates. They were assembled into sections for sewing and the new boards were prepared and everything was left pressing. And the next step was to think about the end papers. Uh, we wanted to be able to reuse the magnificent original double elephant sized marble paper that you could see here in one of the volumes before the project began. And um, we had tried to find a source for an alternative replacement just in case anything went wrong. But in the very short time frame we had for the project, this was simply not possible. So we basically had a plan A and a plan A and no plan B. So it just had to work. Um, the free end papers, that is the ones that weren't attached to the boards, um, came off quite easily in the same way that most of the plates had done. Um, they lifted off without too much difficulty. And we were going to reuse these for the made end papers. Uh, a made end paper is when the decorative paper, that's the free end paper, is laminated to a sheet of just plain paper to make it a stiffener, more stiffen, sorry, more stiff and more robust at the beginning or end of the book. Um, often that lamination incorporates a strip of cloth that provides a reinforced joint where the end paper moves as the book's opened. Because the um, volumes were now going to be a wider dimension, we simply made a much bigger cloth strip because the size and weight of these volumes and knowing that they were going to be very heavily used in the future, we also decided on an extra layer of linen to back up the book cloth. You can see in a little cross section at the top of the screen. Because there was only one chance to reuse the original marbled paper, we practiced and we practiced and we practiced and we practiced again on full size mock-ups to get the whole process worked. It needed two people because of the difficulty of handling these huge sheets of wet paper. Then we practiced one more time and went for it. Once the whole package was assembled, the, it was pressed slightly for a couple of minutes and then pressed in the big press between fresh blotters overnight. You can see on the left where the new cloth and linen joints are added, these are all oversized for trimming later. The paste down end papers, the ones attached to the boards, presented a quite different and a more complicated challenge because the new guarded section um, meant that the books were going to end up being wider. We realized that they would need new boards and therefore the old ones could be sacrificed and could be soaked in hot water to release the original end papers. They were immersed in very, very hot circulating water and just left to allow the paste downs to lift off by themselves. It took a couple of hours and the temptation at this point to poke and see that they were coming off was almost irresistible, but you simply had to leave it to happen because they were terribly fragile. In the end, they would just lift off by themselves and then we could place a sheet of a spun polyester over the top that would 
attach itself by um, surface tension in order to lift the marble paper out. Remarkably, um, there were only a few tiny tears as a result of this whole process. Everything worked extremely well. They were set aside and then the next step was to um, embark on the sewing. Using a template to mark the sewing stations, we had a jig for piercing that allowed the fold to fall down through gravity in order to align everything properly. It took two people to sew these books. Again, we were fortunate to have large enough equipment to accommodate this and an adequate sewing frame that you can see on the right. This volume that we're working on here is volume two, the one that was worked on first to be ready for display during President Obama's visit. The final three volumes were worked on in parallel and sewn together on the frame. Because the books are so big, one person couldn't possibly do the sewing by themselves because you couldn't actually reach from one end of the book to the other. So we had two people working one at each end and passing the sewing needle to each other in the middle. We swapped ends regularly to make sure that the tension was even. As I referred to on Tuesday, we did constant checking and realignment of all the leaves to ensure that the original gilt edges ended up being intact following the sewing. And you can see that we managed to achieve this to everyone's great relief. The end papers were then sewn on separately using a red thread through the cloth joint to make that blend in more easily. Coming to rounding the spine, this is a great example of how size makes you do everything differently. Normally one person manages this quite easily by themselves just on the top of a bench, but this took three people and essentially brute force softening the spine with a layer of paste and then essentially just hauling the whole thing together. We had always been worried that because of the addition of the guards there might have been additional bulk and width to the whole volumes but at this point we were able to offer up one of the saved headbands and could see that it actually still fitted exactly so we had not added any additional bulk to the bindings. The aero linen spine lining and the sewing tapes were incorporated into flanges that would then be inserted to the split of the boards. That I'll come back to a little bit later and here you can see trimming and checking the fit of the flanges. And measuring up and checking everything for the correct alignment. You can see the board there with the lamination of the conservation green board that would go next to the block and the hard mill board on the outside. Hot glue was inserted into the split and then the flanges inserted and the whole lot pressed together firmly. Once the boards were attached, it was time to think about the headbands. And after much um, humming and hawing, we decided not to attempt to sew them on the books, but to sew them separately and then reattach. They were sewn over a core of vellum with linen wrapped around and obviously you had to sew through the vellum rather than underneath the core as would normally happen. Fake book blocks were used to prepare these and then once done the whole thing was attached with glue to the spine. They were then stitched on sewing through the folds of each section to secure them to the text block using a template to mark the sewing holes so they were even throughout. There's a diagram on the top and you can see photos of two of them sewn on. This was basically a belt and braces approach but doing this way ensured total flexibility and movement with the book block and that it would also be separate so that it could be removed and replaced if necessary. The original pattern for the headbands was followed in the same colours, but this time we used dyed linen instead of silk 
for longevity. The spines were then lined with layers of handmade paper adhered with hot glue at first between the sewing stations and then all along the spines. This was then sanded down to achieve a total smooth surface. This would also be hard enough to allow for really crisp gold finishing once the leather was on. The boards were then shaped a little bit, as you can see on the right hand, just to achieve a nice round effect. Over the top of all of these linings, there was a hollow of archival craft lined with linen, and this was boned down really hard. You can see the size from the picture on the left. The hollow allows for a play of movement between the book block and the final leather spine covering. And the flanges were inserted into the split of the split boards. The next step was to create the false raised bands for the cover that were exactly copying the positions on the original binding. This is again a, a strange thing that's normally a process that you don't really think about. It's very simple and straightforward when it's one person working on a normal sized book. But to actually make this work and have it in exactly the same position on all of the bindings was extraordinarily difficult. The spine was then finally covered with a layer of hot glue and allowed to dry. This method of um, adhesive is a very typical Victorian craft process because once the hot glue is on and left to dry and then the leather attached to that pasted out works like a contact adhesive, like a two-part process. Here you see cutting out the leather for the spine and corners, even with the largest skins we could obtain, we had to cut on the diagonal to create a large enough piece for the spine covering. And here you see the leather being attached to the spine and beginning to work around the raised bands and onto the boards. The size meant it took quite a lot of time to do this and to keep the leather damp and both protect the surface at the same time, we essentially had to plaster it with paste and keep working on that. And we used Teflon folders for the smoothness and to protect the surface of the leather. The bindings had to be put down onto the floor to do the turn-ins at the head and tail. This was incredibly awkward and took lots of pairs of hands. Normally it takes just one person to do this process but here you have three, plus another one out of shot with um, fetching sponges and paste and running around helping, and then a fifth to take photographs. Then the forage was laid down in order to do the final um, tweaking and refining the raised bands working. Finally, back on the bench, and using a hammer to tap the, tap the head caps to fully set them before leaving the spine to dry. Once again, a very unorthodox technique necessitated by the large scale of these bindings. I'm going to skip over the nerve wracking business of untying and opening the volume to check that everything was okay and move swiftly onto this picture showing the leather corners having been put on and slightly raised up with a wedge underside to allow them to dry. The edges of the spine and corner leathers were then all trimmed straight and a piece of archival craft glued in between to allow for a completely smooth surface. The board was then glued out to make everything smooth, ready for the book cloth to be put on. Here you can see it being pitched down to the spine layer. We started out by doing the normal process of gluing out the book cloth to lay down, but because of the size of this and the stretch of the book cloth, as we began to put it on, the book cloth was 
stretching before our eyes and it became impossible and we had to quickly whip it off and start again and simply glue out the boards instead. And then inside there we are putting down the end paper cloth joints. And you can see here the final result that I think you will agree was extraordinarily successful. The only thing that really looks different from the original is that there's a much wider cloth joint. So now we were at the stage of the forwarding, i.e. the actual construction of the binding being complete for all four volumes. And all, as I say, all we had to do next was to complete the decorative tooling. It took quite a bit of time experimenting with tools and stamp pads to work out the finishing templates. Here you can see figuring out the layout and spacing for the title, working from one of the rubbings that you can see on the right of the original spine layout. Because the original bindings were not produced in-house in the Windsor Castle bindery, we didn't have exactly all of the same tools to recreate the finishing pattern, but we had enough that were almost the same and very similar to just about recreate it, apart from one crucial one, which was a kind of crescent, or you could call it a croissant or a banana shape, that we had to have one made specially for that and you can see that's um, quite visible in the recreation attempt bindings below. We made lots of different attempts to assemble the pattern and you can see that going on here. Each volume had nine panels along the spine, two of them had titling and seven had ornate patterns. All the decorative patterned panels were exactly the same, apart from the topmost one, which used most of the same tools as the other, but they were inverted to make shape for the royal crest. Once the main pattern was worked out, the positions of small stars and flowers were added to the templates, as shown below. And for the wider volume four, there was an extra width of pattern increased by adding extra small tools to the sides, as in the far right strip. To move on to the practicalities of how to finish on these four massive four volumes, we had a laying press big enough, but with its on, it, on its normal tub, you would have had to have had a trapeze dangling over to achieve the tooling pattern. So in the absence of that, it had to be necessary to come up with something which would allow the press to be much lower down. And for this, we needed essentially a low box that came to be affectionately called the coffin. First, one volume at a time was clamped in place with the forage down to do the finishing across the spine. At this point, the project had been underway for over a year and enormous pressure was being put on the team to get everything finished. We decided at this point that we would use real gold foil instead of gold leaf to speed up the finishing process because that meant we could skip out a couple of steps. Three team members worked in relay fashion to enable a constant flow of work without need for breaks this was physically extraordinarily demanding. One person would go at it until they were feeling tired, then the second take over, followed by the third, and then the first again. We had to totally rely on each other to produce even work. Then all four were clamped together to carry out the final process. At first, the remaining gold of the titling letters had to be put on. And here you can see the blind tooling having laid out the spacing first without gold on part of the title. To digress for a moment, an oddity that we noticed was that the original bindings had the volumes dated on the spine, volume one, 1827 to 30, volume two, 1831 to 34, volume three, 1834 to 35, all very sensibly in sequential order. 
But then volume five, instead of being 1836 to 38, as it is in other copies, was back to being 1831 to 34. And we were rather puzzled by this, but a little investigation revealed what we believed happened. The original binder, when putting the dates on the spine, was probably doing just what was printed on the title pages and following that, as volume four indeed has the same dates as volume two on its printed title page. But if you look very closely, it becomes obvious that it is actually a volume two title page with hand inking, altering the volume number from one to four and the giveaway that it was four letter I's instead of the normal IV for four. We can only speculate why this happened, but presumably, for whatever reason, there was no volume four title page to hand when these sets were bound up. So we decided to preserve this quirk. After all, we were trying to make as close a facsimile binding as possible. So the Royal Collection volume four has on its title lettering the incorrect dates. Let alone having three people complete the finishing work, we often had two people actually working at the same time. And this is something that we've never known anybody to do before. We were extraordinarily relieved that it ended up all looking very even and not looking like it was the work of three people. And here you can see the final result and one of the original spines, and we have kept all of that original material laid on top to show how well we've managed to recreate a facsimile effect. If you recall the picture from Tuesday of the multiple tears in the adjacent leaves, you can see here how the repairs actually end up. The books were finally returned to the library, but to a different room and with new custom shelving that was open at each end and with much more space around them to enable handling. The whole rebinding project took 15 months to complete and it was a privilege to have been part of such a once in a lifetime project. While what was done with the bindings was not particularly unusual, the sheer size meant that nothing could be tackled by one person alone and it required rethinking of every single normal practice in order to work on this grand scale and extraordinary teamwork. However, as amazing as it was to work on these bindings, we have to remember that the real purpose of this project was to preserve the prints, to make the books functional and usable again in order to enable the contents to be accessible to as many people as possible. We were delighted to achieve this end, and now these books are regularly brought out for visitors and included in displays. So I'm going to just now let you see a few of my personal favorites of the wonderful birds that with their distinctive personalities became our friends over the long months spent together. And we must, of course, conclude with the iconic flamingo that everyone knows and loves so well. These robust functioning volumes are now regularly on show. And here you can see one of them that was on display for the enjoyment of guests at the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Sovereign's Lunch in Windsor Castle. <laughs> 
loose ribbons were laid in to mark images that we thought might be of particular interest to the various guests. Thank you so much for taking time to watch this presentation and I hope it will spark a desire for you to go and find out a little bit more about this amazing publication. And I